also the chair of the Puget Sound Harbor Safety Committee, a member of the Puget Sound Area Maritime Security Committee, and a member of the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council. Um, today's uh, going to talk more about the vessel traffic safety that um, Todd's talked out into a little bit. And uh, okay. thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to share with you, and this almost sounds too loud, oh, you, uh, uh, what the current state is. Todd told you about the, the traffic uh, risk, uh, uh, the BITRA and uh, the projects that are in the future. I'm going to talk about current state for the most part, share with you the current vessel traffic uh, statistics. Okay. Yeah, two things. Uh, one is the 125,000 deadweight ton limitation. So this is the size of vessels that can come into Puget Sound, uh, size of our, our uh, tankers. So they're limited to 125,000 deadweight ton by federal regulation. Um, so what that means is, is typically we get the larger tankers that come from overseas. And uh, I know for, for BP, uh, in our practices, what they'll do is they'll come in and then lighter off of um, the coast of California onto a smaller tanker, a 25,000 deadweight ton tanker that then comes up into Puget Sound. So that lightering is not happening in Puget Sound anymore, it's happening elsewhere. Um, the, other, the other part is, um, what was the other part? <laughs> um, well, and that, that is the control depth is, was, was the other piece. Um, so those 125,000 deadweight ton tankers, for example, if there are other, um, other docks that cannot uh, take a fully laden tanker at them, so for example, the, uh, the control depth at the uh, Phillips 66 dock uh, also within the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve is shallower than at the BP Cherry Point dock. So we'll take in a fully laden tanker at Cherry Point. It will offload part of its cargo at Cherry Point, thus raising it in the water, and then go to the Phillips 66 dock and um, you know, discharge the rest of its cargo there. So by kind of sharing um, you know, those, those cargo um, transits, um, we limit the number of vessels that come in, we make sure that, that that transfer is happening at a dock rather than lightering so that it's much, much safer to be done uh, dockside um, and that way all the facilities can get the fuels that they need without having to deal with lightering. I think one of the points that that brings up though is that when you just count transits of tank vessels entering Puget Sound they make multiple shifts. So when you offload half a cargo at BP and then take it down to March Point, you offload it again, that's still counted as one. When, it, when from a risk perspective, it's much, it's much more well, than it's that. It's counted as one in, the, in, in our run. Oh, right, right, but, but in the Vitra, but in the Vitra, it was right, the Vitra used all the separate things. But, so it, 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 has a, it has its own risk associated with it. But when it comes to, um, the tug escorts that we have in both Harrow Strait and Puget and uh, Rosario Strait, one of the things it's important to know that um, we used to have two tug escorts and that when the double hulls came in, there was a deal cut with the Congress and the industry that said if you have a single hull tanker, you need two tug escorts, but if you have a double hull tanker, you need no tug escorts. And the only reason we have a tug escort at all is because of a state regulation since 1977. And then uh, finally, uh, with regards to port state control, it's one of the great things that we have here. And I also want to acknowledge the fact that the data that John brings to the table has been a godsend to the Vitra ground truthing, the work that we've been doing. So we're all very appreciative of that. But there was just this incident with the Sumashir. This was this uh, Russian flag vessel, Sasko shipping line. Well, it just called on Everett, right? And so, and then it loses power up by the Haida Gwaii. And so, you know, these vessels get through that safety net. That's all the point is. Well, we don't, yeah. I, I'm not going to defend it because I don't know this, the, the deal, but it, we don't know why it broke down yet. We, we need to find out why it broke down. And but Russian flag vessels are notorious to be lousy. Anyway. <laughs> 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 
Yeah. We don't know why it broke down. Though. Could have been. David? I'm the executive director of the Marine Exchange of Puget Sound, and there's a, a whole lot of people that don't know what the Marine Exchange does. But we're kind of like a vessel traffic service. The Coast Guard has a vessel traffic service. They're like an air traffic control, only not as directive as an air traffic control would be. They monitor the vessel traffic coming in, and, and they give them information so that they can make a safe voyage. And if they see uh, an incident occurring, they can intervene and, and give some advice. And in and, and the last resort, they will give direction. Uh, but the, on the private sector side, uh, the Marine Exchange exists to, to also monitor that vessel traffic so we can share that information with our customers who are the tow boat operators, the tugs, uh, the line handlers, the agents, the pilots and whatnot, so that they can do their job in a more efficient manner, uh, safe, secure, and also environmentally responsible. So we monitor them, we don't talk to them, but we track them and we talk to the customers who are going to service those vessels at the pier. We do a lot of other things other than the, the uh, monitor the vessel traffic. Uh, we have vessel reports that go out daily to different folks as to what vessels are in the area, uh, what are due to arrive in the next few days. We manage, there's two buoys down in Elliott Bay that we manage, those are used as temporary parking spots for barges on their way out of the, the Duwamish system, headed probably, in most cases, to Alaska, but they bring them out of the Duwamish, park them there, then another tug comes along and picks them up, usually within 24 hours, and takes them on their way to their destination. And we do, we have a 24-7 operation, so we answer our phones in the evening for our customers so that they don't have to, uh, uh, man their phones through the evening and uh, we because we have the expertise we can help with the uh, screening of those calls and make sure they get to the right individuals in the middle of the night. Lots of statistical reports. We have history that goes back to uh, 1992 electronically. We go beyond that in 3x5 cards but it would be a mess to try to look at those. I'll show you the 1992 and beyond data here shortly. The Harbor Safety Committee, of which I am currently the chair, is a volunteer group of folks. It, it's an, incorpor a, an incorporated body, has been for about 15 years now. Um, Harbor Safety Committees exist throughout the country. Some of them is as uh, old as 1965. Uh, I was stationed in Philadelphia, and we had a Harbor Safety Committee there uh, called the Mariner's Advisory Committee. And that group was industry folks who got together periodically at the time, it was industry folks who got together periodically to address how do we safely get a, a new, a novel vessel up the river to the pier that it wants to get to. So there were things just like we're looking at now, either increased traffic or a change in the type of the traffic, and how do we make sure we do that in a safe manner. So this committee has existed in various forms over the years. I was stationed here before in 1989 to 1995, and it was a body, it was an informal body, it was an incorporated body, uh, but it, it got together periodically and talked about vessel safety. It morphed into a group called the uh, uh, Users Group, the VTS Users Group and the Vessel Traffic Service met with those folks periodically uh, to talk about how, what things needed to be improved in vessel traffic service. Uh, the, uh, that eventually kind of tapered off a little bit and uh, Captain of the Port in the late 90s uh, decided he wanted to see the Harbor Safety Committee energized again and, and uh, he took it all the way to the point of incorporating it and it has existed ever since and it meets uh, every two months on a regular basis and we uh, I would say we talk about some very interesting topics uh, in each of those meetings are pretty, pretty full of information. And I don't know, anybody in here attend them other than Fred? I know Tenzum and Scott Tenzum. Anybody else ever attend a Harbor Safety Committee? You're welcome to do so. They are usually always on the first Wednesday of the even months. So the next one is scheduled to be December 3rd, although the captain of the port yesterday told me there might be an issue on that day. I don't know what that is, but right now it's scheduled to be on December uh, 3rd. 
<clears throat> oh, well, no, that's currently we do. At the Federal Center South, it just happens to be a really great facility. It's free. It's got free parking. However, we are talking about moving it around. So in 2015, we're looking at having one meeting up here. Yeah, this is a great location in Bellingham. We'll probably have one meeting down south in uh, Tacoma. And we want to also go further south and take one meeting to Olympia. So we'll probably have three in Seattle, one north, and two south. And it's on the website. Well, what is the website? I think I, no, I don't have it here. Uh, the, the Harbor Safety Committee website is www.pshsc.org. And it's got lots of information on it. So please take a look at the Harbor Safety Committee website. Okay. This is the makeup of the Harbor Safety Committee. Not all these positions are filled uh, currently. Uh, I made it a goal for 2014 to get somebody in every seat. Uh, aquaculture has declined to participate at this point. They say they're interested, but they don't necessarily want to be uh, committed to participating at every meeting. Uh, so if somebody feels like they can represent that body, they are certainly welcome to uh, call me and say so, but I approached the, I think it's called the Pacific Coast Aquaculture Council, or, and they said they declined the seat for, at least for now. Fishing is represented, labor's there, Native Americans are currently there, uh, uh, passenger, all those are filled. We are having an issue at the recreational boater up here as pleasure boat, but uh, getting somebody to tend on a regular basis. I think I just uh, got a new environmental uh, representative. But all those other seats are, are generally always filled at each meeting. Okay. <clears throat> Chris, is that the right name? Yeah. Uh, our advisory members are the Coast Guard, obviously the big one, and then the Corps of Engineers and the others are all there. Uh, as well, although we have difficulty getting the Navy to show up to meetings and uh, the Merit Administrators or Administration, I don't think we've had a member there for quite a while either. But the big one, no, but the other, yeah, I should say the other major uh, advisor is, is clearly the Department of Ecology. So some of the questions you've already asked talked about what, what are current, what's currently going on out there. Well, there is a, a significant uh, vessel traffic management going on in Puget Sound. One of the best in the country, maybe best in the world. Um, there's a very comprehensive safety net, but we don't sit back and, and rest on that. There's always constant or continuous improvement, lots of checks and balances. And we are seeing results here. The Northwest, and as you would expect it to be, has got the best safety record in this country. Uh, and I don't have a slide to show you how this, the numbers have, have gone down over the years throughout the world, throughout the country, but we've always been right down there at the bottom pretty much anyway. We've had some significant casualties and oil spills in the past, but they're in our past and they, we intend to keep them that way. Uh, I'm more of a prevention type person. My 30 years in the Coast Guard, while I had to do some oil spill response, my goal was always to prevent. I always felt like when we had to respond to something, we lost already. We lost the game, because the game should have been to prevent. Risk-based approaches, uh, just to give you a, a quick idea, th there is a international set of standards that apply to all commercial vessels and uh, each of the flag states to which those vessels belong are required to do an inspection on those vessels and certificate that they meet those standards. But there's also a port state control program and that's very significant here in the United States because over 90 percent of the, in fact probably very close to 100 percent of the vessels that call in the United States are foreign vessels. So their flag state inspections are more important to their operation throughout the world. But when they come to the United States, there's a port state control program. 
everybody, all countries have a port state control program, but the United States is probably the best, and that's the United States Coast Guard boarding all these vessels at least once a year, and if not more often, depending on their, their record. And they have a list, and they publish it periodically that says which vessels are the good vessels, which ones are the bad, which operators are good, which operators are bad. And if you're on the bad list, you might get inspected more often. If you're really bad, you might be uh, refused entry into the United States. So the Port State Control, Pro, uh, Control Program has improved substantially in the last 20 years. Um, that's it. And this is a big one. This is a huge one. It doesn't take regulation there, it takes a change in culture. And I think we've established that change in culture over the last 20, 25 years. You know, we, we're not complacent. In the Harbor Safety Committee, we have a Harbor Safety Plan. We update that annually. We, we talk about it all the time, but we make sure we update it annually, and we make sure it gets out to the vessels. The agents do a real good job about getting that Harbor Safety Plan out. That Harbor Safety Plan is a set of regulation, not a set of regulations, a set of standards that go above and beyond the regulations. They complement those regulations. So what we're able to do with a Harbor Safety Plan and a standard of care is develop it in a, in a community group, as you saw, that list of people who sit on the Harbor Safety Committee, get consensus, everybody's favoring this thing, we roll it out there, and every, generally everybody does it. They are voluntary but they, they get done. And they can't sit back and rest. You've reached some goal. You, you gotta keep going, so no complacency. This is more about the, uh, the, uh, the safety net. You asked about tugs, are they already out there? Yes, the tugs are already out there. There's a traffic management system. There's a one-way system in Rosario. Uh, the tug escorts do exist in Heroin Boundary for the tankers that are outbound from uh, Vancouver. Uh, they have a pretty set, pretty uh, detailed standard that they follow as well, the Canadians. The double hulls are there. All tankers now are double hulled. And into the future, all fuel tanks will be protectively located, which means they will be away from the outer skin of the vessel and essentially double hauled as well. Uh, the cargo ships uh, built after the 2004 and beyond will all have their fuel tanks internal away from the outer skin of the vessel. Yes, ma'am. So the double hull pertaining to both vessels that are transiting to Canada? Yes. As well as the Yes. yes. The double hull requirements are international. So all, all they're international. All tankers, all tankers have double hulls. I think the drop dead date was 2015, but I can't imagine there's anyone out there operating a single hull tanker unless it's a third world country. Uh, but most, all the tankers coming to the United States now are all double hulled. Yes. And does Harris Street also have a one way system? No. Yes, sir. Does the double hull standard apply to tug boat tributary barges? It does to the barge. The barges are all double hulled. Not, car not carrying oil. They're all double hull. All the oil barges are double hull. Even bunkers. Pardon. Yes. Excellent. But there are barges running around without any hurt gases. Yes. Could you also talk a little bit about the pilot program? Uh, uh, it's my understanding that most every vehicle or vessel is on a certain size has a, has a pilot on Yes, the vessels coming to the United States get a pilot at Port Angeles that brings them all the way to their destination pier, and they get a pilot from there back out to Port Angeles. For the Canadian vessels, they come in at Port Angeles, they take the left turn and go up to Victoria, they pick up their pilot, and that pilot takes them uh, on to their destination in Canada, and then the reverse, the pilot gets off in Victoria. Canadians are actually talking about making a change to their their pilotage boarding area. But uh, we're going to let them talk about that for a while and we'll see where that goes. But you know, uh, I will talk 
about the cooperation. Maybe I should do that right now. The, there is a cooperative vessel traffic service, and that's one of the reasons I think this is the best vessel traffic service in this country and this world. It's cooperative. It's between two countries. And everybody thinks, well, Vancouver is a lot like, I, 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 I sense they do anyway. Well, that's just the neighbor next door. Well, it's another country, though. It really is another country. And to establish the agreement that we have done back in the late 70s, to, have done, to try to do that today would be next to impossible. What was done in the 70s to create that vessel traffic service as a cooperative vessel traffic service was, was quite amazing and, and forward-looking. Um, we control, well, I should start offshore. The Canadians are the managers of the offshore approaches to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. When a vessel gets into the Strait of Juan de Fuca, it's managed by the U.S. Coast Guard, whether the vessel's on our side of the boundary or the Canadian side of the boundary. They're being managed by the Vessel Traffic Service Center in Seattle. If they continue on to a U.S. port, they continue to be managed by the U.S. Coast Guard at the Vessel Traffic Center in Seattle through into Rosario or down admirably into Seattle and Tacoma, Everett. Except if they do, if that vessel is bound to some port in Rosario but takes the Harrow and Boundary route, it's going to get managed by the Canadians in Harrow and Boundary. The Canadians manage Harrow and Boundary and they manage the Ger Georgia Strait on into Canada and, and uh, the ports of Canada. But those two centers, actually there's multiple centers in Canada that's being reduced to two, uh, there's one center in the United States. They talk to each other on a regular basis, on the phone or on the radio. They're talking all the time. They talk when they trade vessels, when a vessel uh, moves across that line into the Canadian managed area, there's a, there's a switch off. There's a procedure for that switch off. They meet uh, every six months in a procedures group to make sure that the procedures that they're following are, are good and updated and they make any modifications uh, necessary, as I said, no complacency, always making continuous improvement. And there's a, a management body called the Joint Coordinating Group, which also gets together every uh, six months to, uh, to uh, talk about any strategic improvements that they need to make. I was, for three and a half years, the chair or co-chair of the Joint Coordinating Group when I was the chief of the Marine Safety Division for the 13th Coast Guard District. Uh, like I said, both centers these are, are managing these vessels as they come in. They don't necessarily get involved in giving them direction, as you might see with an air traffic control. But if they see a situation developing, they'll, they'll get more involved. If they see it getting going beyond that, they might intervene. They might give direction. And they have done that on occasion. Oh, I'm sorry. Good. Well, I'm going to zip through this then. It's really five minutes, yeah. Um, these are standards of care. It's kind of what a standard of care is. I'm not going to read that out. But they're voluntary. They're, they're reached by consensus, so that, that's helpful to make sure that they're complied with. But as I shared when I was in Philadelphia, and I, and I, I, I make it a point to mention it here, Standards of care are as important as laws and regulations and, and almost as enforceable because if you have an accident, if you didn't follow standards of care, you might be found negligent and that can change the, you know, your legal status quick, quickly, your liability status. So there's you. A little bit about the vessel traffic management system. Not, uh, not that long ago, uh, well, it's about 15 years ago now, we moved the entrance further offshore. 10 miles out so that you can see where they converge now. They used to con converge at, uh, right at Cape Flattery. Now it's 10 miles further out. There's an area to be avoided that was developed about 15 years ago. NOAA has really the oversight of that, but that's an internationally designated area to be avoided. What that does is put the vessels farther offshore so that if they have a situation that might turn into an incident, that uh, they're far enough offshore that assistance can come to their, their aid. Uh, I kind of mentioned the Coast Guard a little bit. There's 96-hour uh, advance notice. Rival vessels are screened four days before they enter the system. Um, there are pre-arrival test requirements in the regulations. 
We now have a emergency response towing vessel at Nia Bay as required. It's been, actually been out there for 15 years for different parts of the year. Originally funded a little bit by Coast Guard money, Navy money, some NERDA money. But anyway, it's been out there for a long time. The state funded it for a while. And in 2010, the state, state said that the industry was going to start funding it. Uh, I'm intimately, intimately familiar with it because my office does the administration for it. So we, we do all the invoicing. The, it's per voyage, per, per arrival fee for coming in to have that tug out at the Bay. Um, pilot boards, I already mentioned the pilot boarding area. Statistics, we'll run through these real fast. As you can see, since 1992, the general trend of vessel traffic is, is downward in Puget Sound. This is US bound vessels only, and I'll mention the Canadians in a minute. But uh, the deep draft vessels have been on the decline since 1992, and there's various reasons for that. Bulkers dropped off, there's not as many logs for us to export. Uh, container ships are going down now, primarily because they're getting bigger. And so you can bring in more containers on one ship. You don't need two, three. They've gone from carrying 5,000 containers to the biggest one is, I think, in construction is going to carry 18,000 uh, TEUs, TEU being a 20-foot container. A TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. But you can see the containers still rise, and then they're starting to dip. Tankers, are, uh, tankers themselves are on a, on a decline. But the ATBs are, on a, are probably steadied out pretty much now. Passenger ships certainly picked up here in the, around 2000. Articulated tug and barge. So when it's, a, it's a tug that marries up with the barge in a fixed manner as opposed to towing it on a wire. <clears throat> This just shows a better picture of the container traffic is versus all that, or excuse me, the tanker traffic. So you've got the tankers overall. Tanker, tank ships themselves are on a decline. ATBs, a slight incline. Pretty steady, steady right now. Um, container ships, bulkers, big drop in the bulkers. That's what traffic looked like on Thursday, right? Thursday, the 25th. Now, please, please, you got to look at this and you say, this is really congested. And I get other people look at it and they say, those icons are way too big. They're more likely a dot, OK? And it's, I, I probably should have tried to zoom in, in fact, and show you what it, when you get real close up what the size of the vessel is and how far apart each of these are. But there are a lot of them are very far apart. All that yellow stuff is recreational boaters, not required to have, no time left, not required to have uh, AIS. That's the Strait of Juan de Fuca on Thursday at that time. Your area may be of interest, and we take the recreational boaters out, that's what's left commercially. If I can have this one minute, I'll share just real quick with you. Okay, uh, this, when I said I was showing you traffic for the United States, that's what we track at the Marine Exchange. But we're also capable of doing what we call passage lines, data reports. And so we've created seven passage lines, and we're starting to track these vessels as they come in. And it doesn't matter where they go. We know how many cross that line. So at Nia Bay, we know for, since July of last year what the, it looks like as far as inbound vessels crossing at Nia Bay in through the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and how many of them took the route through Harrow, through the line at Harrow, that's how many went Harrow. You see a slight increase in here because the Canadian traffic is, on, is growing a little bit right now. It has nothing to do with the major projects that we've been considering or looking at. Boundary, you see a slight increase there. Point Roberts definitely can see it. more vessels going into Canada. That's into Canada. So anyway, what we're doing with this data now is looking at actual traffic. 
and marrying that up to incident reports that the Coast Guard maintains so we can see as the trend in vessels traffic goes up or down what's happening with the incidents in relation to that. Some people ask me, how do we compare to other places in the world or in the country? This is just a chart of other places in the country. 2012, Houston gets 15,000 vessels a year. If you add Seattle area together, we're getting roughly, um, and th this is misleading. This says that we're getting close to, you know, what that add up to uh, just over 6,000 vessels. About 1,000 of the vessels that arrive in the United States also go to Canada and vice versa. So, so we're counting some of the same vessels in those numbers. As I showed you with those other numbers, the passage lines, Todd said it earlier, about 4,000 vessels are entering the system. So between those 4,000 vessels are spreading out and they're doing their business in, in the system. That's a one month period of vessel track lines out of, out of the Strait of Juan de Fuca. The green being cargo vessels, the red being tank vessels. They're going further offshore. You can generally see that they the green and the red, for sure, are avoiding the area to be avoided. But you get some towing vessels in here. They're not towing oil. You get a lot of fishing vessels in here. They're not restricted from going in there. That's it. <laughs> Questions? Question about lightering. Uh, this is more a curiosity than anything else, but I was involved with a dredging project back in 89-90, these sort of things, which reduced the amount of lightering necessary uh, to serve Cherry Point refineries and also March Point. And I was kind of curious as what impact of the elimination of lightering had on vessel safety and risk of oil spill in Puget Sound. Uh, see if you can address that. There's not the yeah, I, I don't know that I can. I, I, I came. I don't know, how much lightering do you think we did, Scott? We didn't do much. I know we established a, we have a standard of care in the harbor safety plan and how lightering is going to be done. There are some places in the country that have regulations. The Gulf has regulations. Um, but we did lightering in, in the Delaware River uh, when I was the captain of the port in Philadelphia. And we had vessels, that every vessel, every tanker that came into the refineries on the Delaware River had to be lightered because the river is 40 feet. They come in at 55 into the bay and lighter into barges, and those barges would come up the river then and deliver their cargo. Uh, then the tanker, once it got down below 40 feet, could then come up the river to the refinery. You imagine the number of tr transits we're talking about, barges and tankers. So if you didn't have to lighter, it would be a whole lot, a whole lot better just to take one vessel all the way to the to its port. And we don't do it, we're not doing lightering right now. Good. Thank you. Mike Larson. Yeah, I think there are two things that, that uh, have really helped us in that venue. Um, 